Thanks. Well, starting with an applause, that's, that's something. Oh, a few words about me. Oh, as you see, I don't have great years, but it's a long time that I'm working in IT. So that was my first personal computer, the first piece of hardware. Maybe someone remembers it. It was the predecessor of the ZX81, which was the predecessor of the, Z, of the Sinclair Spectrum. Maybe someone remembers it. I worked in a number of companies through my history, and currently I'm working in Les Lewis. You see a name in the middle, and I worked there for a lot of years. And this explains something on what we will see later on. Uh, I work in the community. Now I uh, run the community for the Limerick, which is in Ireland, where, uh, where I work now. And looking for speakers for my community. So if you're interested, to make a tour in Ireland. My talk will be about those topics. So uh, what happened in my company in the last six months, uh, which uh, there were a number of uh, events. Uh, so uh, I described the study that I found, uh, uh, what does it mean, uh, and how we are trying to evolve. So what's the plan to change the current state? Uh, and. Uh, the second part of the talk was more about uh, some technical details of how we are trying to implement, not very deep ones. So this is more 100 level uh, talk, maybe 150, because uh, the previous slides were, the previous talks were really high level. So I always like a little technical background so uh, we can grasp uh, something. Uh, there will be the bibliography at the end of the slide, next slide, uh, which will be published on SlideShare. I usually do this uh, kind of thing. And then we'll try to summarize what uh, the arguments. So, my company. I arrived in Glass Lewis uh, six months ago or so, and it was really a brownfield state. Uh, it was a great set of applications, really, really interesting, a lot of things, but. Uh, a bit like, you know, in Barcelona, uh, the cathedral, <sighs> incomplete. <laughs> like Gaudi's cathedral, incomplete. So there were a lot of stuff and a lot of manual work has been done to build these things. Uh, some very big applications, some big size databases. But uh, the infrastructure was all running uh, uh, in virtual machines and stuff like that. Also, the practices of code development were kind of waterfallish. Okay, so there, were, there are still, we have a number of uh, source code branches and those source code branches are mapping one-to-one -to, -one to environments. So we have a QA branches, the UAT branches, the production branch, and so, uh, kind of a messy state. But that's not all. There is more to the, to the picture. Because it's not just that there's a single application with a single system with a single technology. I found that there were a number of different technologies in use. Uh, some stuff in Azure, the QA environment for that application. That other team is, has everything on AWS. Uh, the main production environment for the main application is in Rackspace. Uh, some teams are using uh, uh, Linux, other Teams are using uh, Windows, SQL, MySQL, different languages. Really, a soup of this thing. Uh, even the pipelines were using different stuff. So, uh, two teams that, uh, were using uh, TFS. Other teams were using GitHub Enterprise. So, again, a soup of most uh, things. Uh, and now we understand uh, why uh, my background in working on the Microsoft technology was useful for this company because uh, the major apps and the major system are running on the Microsoft platform, so Windows and SQL Server, those are the uh, big things uh, for us. So, we had a lot of issues. Uh, I just tried to put here a few of them, not everything, so that we can be countless. It's a classic state of a brownfield, so, we need to deploy a new version of the app. We need to alert the user that we, the system will be unavailable for the uh, interval window when we do the deployment. So, uh, user will be affected every time we do a deployment. We need to have uh, our business guy that do 
uh, validation after we deploy that everything is working correctly and so on and so forth. But even pure IT operation things like updating the system with security patches requires them time. So there is a lot of work to do. Uh, and uh, what I've seen uh, from developers, from IT ops, uh, the system is running and must be running uh, all the time, and so the fear of touching the system, even the frequency of deployment was not so bad, because they deployed, say, once a month, so could be worse, at least uh, the team that I'm following more closely. But there was still this fear of deploying to production, you know, changing the config files and, and so on and so forth. This state of things uh, was not pleasing the business because the business wants to grow and to have the IT response well to their needs so that we, the development team can deliver faster, quicker, more reliable, uh, and so on and so forth. So I consider this as a growth crisis that all companies face sooner or later. Every system will face it unless the system goes in maintenance mode that is going out of, uh, out of use. Every system that is successful starts as a green field, everything is good, uh, we take shortcut along the road, we grow our technical depth, and the technical depth piles up, piles up, piles up until you get this moment of crisis. And then you start to change. And the change can be forced by business, forced by the market, for, can be different forces on, on, on this. So, what the company decided to do? So, first of all, we decided to go in the DevOps direction, and DevOps is not just for open source. We are mostly Windows and SQL Server, so they found some guy who has knowledge about these things that can help them in uh, uh, delivering a DevOps pipeline and using the tool, the proper tool for, for Windows. Also, other people changed. So the vice president of technology changed, so he was hired one week or two before me. A uh, few months later, I was a Scrum Master, some new people uh, arrived, some senior developers. So there have been a turnover in the teams uh, in order to cope with the change in order to have new processes, new habits, instead of moving out from waterfall to a more uh, agile system um, processes. And in fact, we had also some weeks of agile training. Um, my manager started a program that we have an internal training every week. So we spend at least one, two hours every week with internal training. We just finished with a series on test-driven development. So we are progressing and attacking the problem of brownfield from multiple directions. We invested in training, as I said, resources, not just people, but also uh, for example, we uh, approved spending more in more cloud resources to create new environments and test them, make sure that they have enough performance from the business requirement to invest in new tools, new licenses, and so on. And in quality, because, yeah, the guys, there, there were a lot of tests in the code, in the, in the code base, a lot of unit tests, a lot of integration tests, and they were failing and they were failing. And we tried to enhance the build pipelines and they were failing. So, start again. New definition of done, you cannot deliver a feature without automated testing and the automated testing must be green. Okay, so changing the process, changing the tool and with focus on quality and delivering. And the plan is very simple. We need to rebuild the system gradually so, some call it the strangler uh, pattern. Uh, I prefer to just say rebuilding. Uh, so, like renewing a house, so you don't destroy it, you don't tear down the wall. The applications are good. The business is successful, but we need to improve. We need to improve everything in order to deliver more and more often. So, uh, my focus was in the 
last few months, especially on those topics, so on automating a lot of stuff, and uh, we decided for this set of uh, tooling. Terraform for the infrastructure, uh, PowerShell, PowerShell DSC for the uh, application stack for configuring it, could be asked to that soon, and most pipelines will be using uh, TFS slash Visual Studio Team Services. Uh, they have a role in, uh, in the solution, so why Terraform is about creating in the cloud uh, the network infrastructure, uh, disks uh, and other cloud resources, creating virtual machines. Uh, we stop at that level, so just at the infrastructure level. Then we have other tools, so we will talk more in details, uh, PowerShell DSC to configure everything that is inside the virtual machine. So for Windows, as an example, you can configure IIS, the SSL certificate, uh, local users, uh, permission on the file system, and so on. Uh, for Linux, we have, I still have really uh, to work uh, deep on that. So for now, there are some bash scripts that help us in setting up the environment. And then there is the application level where we uh, use mostly uh, MS deploy, web deploy to uh, deploy these things and with TFS to orchestrate all those tooling. And the next step is to move out from the on-premise hardware and move to the cloud. That's our uh, major topics for the next month. It's work in progress and we are trying to do our best to do uh, as much as possible. The target would be to have everything automated, uh, say, in a year from now, something like that. So it's not something that happens overnight. It doesn't come from free, in fact, there were investment from the management. And as we see, every technology has a proper sweet spot and you need to compose multiple tools uh, to get a very smoothly working solution. And spread knowledge, so I, when I was hired, I refused the title DevOps engineer because I don't want to be an engineer. I want to have every single person in the team to be DevOps just like me, to be DBA just like me, to be QA just like other people, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, to have a cross-functional team, to have people that are able to read, at least, other pieces of code, they are starting uh, to, to understand this. So, in fact, I had the pleasure of seeing some pipelines beat by developers. Yeah. So, the first pillar is Terraform. And Terraform, if you never saw it, is basically a declarative language okay, a domain-specific language, to describe resources in a cloud, mostly. Uh, this is a sample code. You see the first line here is about describing a resource, which is an Azure virtual machine. And then there are all the details, all the properties that I want for this machine, uh, if I want it big, small, and so on and so forth. I, just very, very declarative. Uh, you have the rich language because you have variables, functions, so you can have a lot of these things computed uh, on the fly. And then what you do, it's a simple command line tool. You have this tool on your machine, on the machine where you run the command, where you have the scripts. So you run like, I don't know, an interpreter, okay? Terraform apply is the command that will parse all the Terraform declaration, all the Terraform scripts that are in that folder, and we'll apply them. So if the folder contains the script that describes a virtual machine, we'll create a virtual machine in the cloud. Okay, similar for Ditto for our other resources like network, uh, subnet, uh, firewall rules, uh, whatever. It is a, also an interesting uh, concept, which is resource providers, which means Terraform is not for Azure, okay? Terraform is very uh, cross-platform. Uh, you can run it on Mac, on Linux, no problem, because, because it's written in Go. And uh, uh, you can build uh, resources not just in the Azure, but in AWS, and in additional providers. So, for example, 
it allows you to have your production, say, in Azure, and have your disaster recovery in AWS, and you manage everything using those scripts in Terraform, okay? Which is really nice. And maybe you have your DNS in a third provider, and like GoDaddy, and declare there the switches in, uh, the changes in the DNS. Uh, and uh, as this idea of state metadata, which is one of the things you need to be uh, aware of. Uh, because there are four things uh, to be aware before adopting this tool um, in order to use it profitably and avoid uh, uh, traps. So uh, you need to properly manage the state uh, because yes, it reads all the source code that you have written in a folder, compares this with what is written in the state uh, and what is in the target provider. So it means that it looks up in your file to see, okay, you have declared that you want a machine named demo. Okay, look up in the resource file. Okay, this machine demo is named uh, dem demo 01 in the cloud. So it's looking in the cloud for a machine named demo 01. Uh, perfectly, it works perfectly, but if you have multiple people working on it and you don't want to lose this mapping, you need to have this uh, information in a shared location and reliable. So they suggest to use uh, stuff like uh, AWS S3 or Azure Storage or similar. Folder structure, okay, I don't go into details, but you need to organize all your DS, uh, all those Terraform files properly in order to organize uh, the chunks of your infrastructure uh, according to the frequency of changes, uh, create modules, and all these kinds of things. Um, if you want, I have details on uh, how we are doing it. Similar uh, for the naming uh, of the objects that you have in the Terraform scripts uh, should be very forward thinking because if you change them, uh, the mapping between the source code and the target uh, resources in the cloud doesn't match, and so it breaks apart. And uh, instead of uh, updating a resource, it will destroy and recreate, which is, if it is a database resources, you know what I mean, okay? And last but not least, keep everything in source control. This should be kind of obvious, but just in case I put as the fourth item in the list not to forget. Uh, those two are wonderful. It's wonderful to have the ability to describe my infrastructure using source code and run a single command to recreate it. But it could be dangerous. It could be dangerous because uh, if you do a mistake and you were pointing to your production environment, you can destroy it, which is not pretty good sometimes. So uh, automation is good, but should be also controlled. Uh, it is feasible, so you may put authorizations, uh, point in your automated pipelines, or stuff like that. So you need to have some kind of monitoring and double checking before applying changes to some environments like your production or disaster recovery. Uh, so there is a way of properly managing Terraform. You need to study it, and it's very, very powerful and very effective. Uh, it's also very easy to integrate with your uh, CI CD tooling, uh, because for example, in, in TFS VSTS, we have a, a task, a dropping task that you can just use it, but it's a common line tool, so you can use it in Jenkins or Team City or whatever you like. So, uh, application stack. We have a set of virtual machines and a few other resources, and we need to configure the dreaded internet information server. Okay, could be worse. Uh, I'm not talking about configuring Nginx and the other stuff, because I still have to get there. I'm working on the important stuff for now. Uh, those are kind of uh, collateral uh, applications. Uh, this is a quick uh, sip of what is desired state configuration. This, uh, it is a feature that is in 
Windows since, I think, 2008 data or two or something like that. So it's pretty available in any practical supported version of Windows. Uh, not many knows it or use it um, as much as it should. Uh, but it's something to consider. It's declarative language, uh, and under domain-specific language, again, you see, I want a configuration of this which implies to having these pieces configured on my machine. Uh, there are a lot of uh, options to uh, configure pieces of Windows. Uh, you can configure, create local users, configure groups, so you can put domain uh, people in a uh, local administrator group, you can uh, lock down by applying registry keys, and a lot of, lot of stuff. You can do practically everything. Uh, the role that uh, I use uh, for this tool is to configure an environment uh, from the basic OS level up to everything that, conf that an application needs, but not the application itself. There are people that are so crazy to use DSC for deploying apps, but I don't think it's the role of it. I want to, to add there a lot of modules, and you need to use your favorite search tool like Google uh, to find uh, stuff. Uh, it could be also a bit problematic because sometimes you find uh, obsolete information. That's always the problem with the with the search engines today. It was so good say 10 years ago, there was only a version of software. And nowadays there are so many flavors and you see so much obsolete information. Anyway, moving forward, uh, there is another piece uh, very useful, uh, which is chocolatey. Chocolatey is uh, the most commonly used uh, package manager in uh, the Windows environment. So it's the equivalent of uh, apt-get, uh, yum, uh, and so on and so forth, if you come from um, Linux. Uh, you see, it's very simple and has a huge library of stuff uh, uh, that you can use. For example, um, you can use it to configure an automated uh, test machine by installing Chrome, by installing Selenium, by installing all those pieces. Okay. Uh, it's not something coming from Microsoft, it's, uh, but there is some serious endorsement by Microsoft. It's something you can uh, use without uh, thinking twice. Uh, if you don't trust uh, pulling down software from an external source, uh, you can set up your own repository server, folder share in whatever you like, uh, and have the packages inside the, the perimeter of your firewall. So it can reside in your corporate network and you properly manage uh, uh, what you deploy. So we have three things. We'll say more. Uh, DSC has multiple ways of uh, working. Uh, you can work, use it in a push mode. So you have these PowerShell scripts uh, and you send it to a machine. So the machine will start executing it and uh, configure the machine the way you want. And this is something you can do from Terraform. So you can just run Terraform apply and uh, having Terraform pushing the scripts to the target machine. Uh, another option could be to use your deployment pipeline. So you can have uh, uh, your Team City, Jenkins, Bamboo, TFS even, that will use WinRM to, to push it to the target machines. Or you can use Azure Automation if you are working in Azure, which is pretty nice. It gives you for free uh, a central location uh, where all machines can uh, pull and uh, self-heal in case of need. So it's, it's very, very useful. Uh, so uh, this is for the uh, PowerShell DSC thing. It's very useful for Windows, truly. They, there is uh, work on implementing something similar for Linux with PowerShell 6. Uh, we'll see how far they will go. It will be very, very interesting if, uh, like us, uh, you are 
80-20, so you are 80% Windows and 20% Linux. Uh, it's very robust, easy to centralize, yeah. Uh, what you need to do is to properly plan uh, how you manage credentials, uh, certificates, uh, keys, and this kind of stuff, because that's the thing that requires more forward thinking and planning, because it's, uh, um, it's very secure. It pretends that you work in a secure way. Okay, a uh, few words about our pipelines. Okay. Uh, uh, the pipelines help us in defining releases, really in uh, uh, um, patchwork use. So uh, for some, yeah, for some they are uh, very, very well, road, um, they are working very well. Uh, your pipeline, uh, using uh, a, a sophisticated tool like uh, TFS, uh, you can put a proper access control list, authorization, and auditing, so you have a track of what's happening on each system, and have the system that has access to even production, and people can request changes to production without having access to it. Uh, can be useful to uh, orchestrate, uh, as I said before. And another thing you can uh, think about how you organize your pipeline. Instead of having a, an entire pipeline that is deploying your global Uber arching uh, application to have a pipeline that maybe one is just delivering the database patches and another one is deploying the application. So you can have different timing to deploy the various pieces of the system. And also, uh, some quick hotfix path can be useful in case you don't want to run the entire suite of uh, integration and end-to-end -end testing that takes hours. So, <laughs> wrapping up, so I'm on time. Uh, infrastructure as code is the incarnation of this principle of the Agile Manifesto, working software over comprehensive documentation. Instead of having a 100 pages docu Word document full of snapshots that describes how to configure a Windows system, which is kind of the norm uh, until yesterday, you have software that describes the configuration. So IAS and all other stuff. There are a lot of other things. Uh, things that I have not talked about, like uh, we set up a task force uh, and so on. And there are a lot of things uh, that we haven't tackled because they are, we are trying to focus on the most important things that will give us more, more benefit currently. So there are th things like trunk-based development. I'm dreaming of it. It's not something that I can tackle today. So something that it's in the pipeline. A few bibliography, continuous delivery, seminal book on the CD, uh, the DevOps handbook, a must read if you want to be serious uh, in uh, implementing DevOps, a lot of tips, not too technical details, but enough to start, um, and very, very, very comprehensive. Technology, Terraform, that's the, bo the book to read if you want to use Terraform. DS book, that's the book you need to read and have uh, uh, with yourself to read it. Uh, by the way, this one is always constantly updating. It's only in electronic form. Uh, there are a few books that you may find useful for, for the thing. Uh, another few links of things we talk about or can be interesting in implementing these things. Final word. Uh, moving a brownfield application to DevOps, it's not something that happens overnight. It's something you need to build slowly, brick by brick. Okay. It's not something that you snap your finger and you have everything. It takes, it takes months just to start, having, uh, start people being aware and start agreeing on a process, start agreeing on a tooling, start agreeing on moving forward with these things. But it's worthwhile. I'm starting to see the first fruit of it. And with this, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs>